Welcome to the Christian Men at Work podcast, where I interview men from all walks of life with varying job titles who have one thing in common. They are all choosing daily to live out their Christian faith through their work, and because of that, they are leading, prospering, glorifying God, and experiencing joy and purpose in their work, and you can too. Men at Work, welcome to episode 44. Let's start with a walking tip to help you walk with the Lord. If you've followed my Wednesday work advice on my YouTube channel, you've seen where I've talked about why and how to memorize scripture. Up until now, I have never did share an app that I have heard about from Dr. Joe Martin from the Real Men Connect podcast, and I want to tell you about it. It's called Scripture Typer. Which and it's also called Bible Memory App. I've seen it under both names. And there is a free version. I have the pro version, which is not very expensive, and it gives you a bunch of different translations to choose from. I won't get into the details right now, because this is a quick tip about why it's so great or how to use it. Um, I do plan to cover it in more detail in a future Wednesday work advice. Today I'm going to be speaking with Greg Jackson. Greg, an adopted Charlottean, father of three girls, was a rapper and a sous chef when the September protests began. He showed up with others to pro- protest the Charlotte Mecklenburg Police Department at its headquarters the day after the shooting of Keith Lamont Scott. But a crucial conversation that day changed his trajectory. Eventually, he founded the nonprofit Heal Charlotte, helped train officers how to communicate with the community in volatile situations and has created an after-school camp for at-risk youth in his northeast Charlotte neighborhood of Orchard Trace Condominiums. Sorry, Orchard Trace Condominiums. Serving the community and being a bridge of communication between the community and its officials is what drives him. In his words, if everybody did a little, no one will have to do a lot. Let's get right to our interview with Greg Jackson. Greg, thanks a lot for joining the call today. I really appreciate it. Oh, man, thanks for having me. So I'm going to start out with the same question I ask everybody, which is tell us a little bit about um, when and how you became a Christian. Oh, man. Um, Well, I was always having uh, influence inside of my house. My mom is um, a devout Christian, man. She's a woman of God to the fullest extent. (laughs) I literally uh, thought Jesus was in the room with my mom, like the physical (laughs) <laughs> Jesus, uh, the way she always mentioned him, always prayed, and always kept him in our lives, uh, going to Bible study early in my life, and going inside of the church. It was my first introduction to um, to uh, Jesus and, and uh, the wonderful works of the kingdom. Um, so it, it started in my childhood with my mother influencing me at a very young age. And then moving on to being an adult, um, of course, I shied away from a lot of the things that I was I was seeing. I was um, also far from the pulpit, so uh, the pastors that I previously had weren't tangible. Um, and uh, when I I did a year in jail um, for doing, uh, com- you know, out here in the streets trying to make an extra dollar and found out more about the Lord in jail and um, he got me out of a lot of situations there. And of course, when I got out, I reverted to some old ways and probably about three years ago after the protests and the riots, I got baptized again in the name of Jesus and uh, dedicated my life to him and doing the work of the kingdom um, probably three years ago. And I haven't looked back since. All right. Well, um, I also understand that you were a rapper and a sous chef. Did I say that correctly? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. How did you how did you get into both of those? Well, my mom wrote my first rap when I was like 12. Um, and that was an experience. And then from there, I kind of just kind of took it on. 
um, from just creating and rapping myself. I just loved creating. Uh, so I was rapping for the world. Um, and I was, uh, my grandmother told me one time, I know you don't think, excuse me, she said, I know you don't think out of all of these millions of people that want to be rappers that you just have an easy way into this industry, which of course I did. And um, she said, plan B, and you better have a backup plan. Um, you better have a backup plan. And those words stuck with me. My grandmother told me that, God rest her soul. And I went to the Art Institute of New York and um, pursued my career in, in the culinary world. And um, from there, moving down to Charlotte, I was able to uh, be a part of some great restaurants, um, Fahrenheit, BLT, uh, the Hilton. I worked at the Hilton um, for a good while. Uh, as a sous chef, and then vinyl pie as a sous chef also. So it was a great experience um, serving. The wonderful thing about being a rapper and a sous chef, you're serving. You're either serving musically or you're serving in culinary. But the job is to make people have the best experience they can possibly have while they're with you. Now, well, that's, that's awesome. That's got to be rewarding. Um, yeah. So, yeah. So, uh, so how old are you now? I'm 35. I'll be 36 this year. Okay. So, um, so that brings us, I guess, up to the nonprofit that you that you started. And so there was a period there where there were several protests around the country, a lot of tension relating to um, shoots and shootings, and one of those occurred in Charlotte. Yes. And I don't know, I'll be honest, I don't know a lot about the details of that particular event. So maybe tell us a little bit about what you know about what what happened in Charlotte and then kind of what what led you to attend uh, a protest uh, as a result of that shooting. And then and then maybe I guess from there you can talk about a conversation that you had that changed your trajectory. But maybe first just give us some background on that that event itself. Yeah, um, September 2016, September 23rd. I'll never forget it. Um, young man, um, well, on the 21st, a young man named uh, Keith Lamont Scott uh, was was brutally shot down in the middle of a neighborhood in North Charlotte. Um, and like you stated before, there was a number of shootings that were happening in the year 2016 where young African-American men were just um, shot down in the streets without having uh, any any guns on them, any weapons on them. So uh, we were definitely upset already before the Keith Lamar Scott shooting happened. And it happened in Charlotte. And we, at the time, we as a city were very disruptive. Um, we were very alarmed. Um, we were caught off guard. We weren't prepared. So everybody were was a little um, caught off guard about this actual shooting, from the government to city council to to uh, CMPD to the neighbors of the community and even the protesters. Uh, we all came with our own perception of what was actually going on. Uh, Keith Lamar Scott, um, young in his 20s, um, father of three, I believe, and um, suffering from PTSD also, um, had some mental health issues, didn't take his medicine that day. And my brother called me. After that shooting on Old Concord, he was on Old Concord, which is a road down down the block from where the shooting actually happened. And he was outside riding with a lot of uh, other neighbors who were, you know, justified and in their upset of, of their feelings of being upset and mad and disappointed. And he called me and 
I'm watching on the news, and he said, hey, man, we out here. We're going to give them what they deserve, and they need to understand, you know, we're not going to stand for this no more. And I watched these these kids, these young men and women, um, stand on top of cop cars, break into a cop car, um, throw rocks at the police. And, of course, the police were throwing tear gas and things of that nature at them. So it was a, a very hard scene to watch, knowing that my brother was out there. I was fearing for his safety. And I told myself, as a rapper, first off, hip-hop is supposed to be the CNN of the community. We're supposed to be activists um, with a voice. Um, and I really, not all of my music reflected that, but some of my music did. And I really wanted to let Charlotte know that there were music artists out here on the independent scene, on the underground scene, that cared about what was going on in the community also. Uh, the culture and the state of the the state of hip hop and, and rap in the country right now doesn't reflect uh, what it started to be and how it started out. And that was to be a voice of the community because the news didn't really come to the community. And uh, seeing my little brother out there, man, kind of broke my heart. And I wanted to uh, show him the right way to protest if you were going to protest. So really me going out there to protest on the second day um, wasn't really because of any feelings of my own, but it was really to show my little brother uh, the right way to do things and the right way to voice your opinion um, and not to be looked at as, as, um, as a wild person that's just been let out the cage, you know, um, and a person full of rage that has no self-control and uh, can't articulate themselves to voice their opinion in an intellectual way. So people that don't look like you, don't walk like you, and don't come from your background can actually understand what you're trying to say. And I really wanted him to see that. And then I wanted the city to be able to see that we don't all look like that. And we don't all act like that. And we all don't voice our opinions through a riot. Um, the next day, I decided to go downtown with another rap friend of mine. Um, goes by the name of Mo Crane. Good friend of mine. And we talked. And I told him, I said, man, I'm going to go down there. And uh, he said, hey, if you're going to go, I'm going to go with you. You know, I got your back. And um, we went downtown and stood on the corner of North Tryon and Trade Street, man. I can never forget this. There were young men and young women standing on the corner with tape over their mouths doing a silent protest. And like I said, I'm from New York. Uh, and we're boisterous and opinionated, loudmouth. Uh, and I did not understand that type of protest either. So it went from a riot type of protest, which I was completely against, all the way to a silent protest, which I was against also. I didn't see how anybody can really understand your emotions through you just holding a sign. So me and my friend Mo Crane decided to count down from 20 seconds to a zero. We told the crowd, hey, we are going to march to the police department. This is the problem. This is where we, where we want to go. This is where we need to be. This is where our so-called enemy is at. This is where they are. Let's go to the police department. So we proceeded to count from 20 to zero. Uh, I started walking when we got to about five. Uh, I looked at Mo Crane and we turned around and when I tell you it was a hundred and something people, 200 people behind us, by the time we were halfway down that block, that's exactly when we realized, whoa, we have entered into the belly of the beast. We have entered into what might be our purpose as leaders, why we actually came down here. And um, 
from there, man, I just didn't look back. You know, when um, God gives you breadcrumbs of blessings, man, you have to pick those up and keep following them until the bigger blessing comes. Um, and I just, I couldn't turn away from God anymore at that moment in my life from, you know, being from New York, watching my dad sell crack and uh, trying to pick up the family business, as people would say, um, and trying to be like my dad, getting locked up, um, having favor while I was in jail and walking away from my purpose from so many times uh, and realizing that uh, God was still with me no matter how many times I've kind of shied away from what he's aligned for me to do. In that moment, man, I just had to pick up the cross and, and really just say, I'm going to live it out and I'm going to do what you are putting in front of me. Let your will be done and mean it in, in all ways and really mean it and accept whatever his will was at that moment. And we walked down to the police department, man. No justice, no peace. No racist police. No justice, no peace. No racist police. Whose streets are it? There are our streets. Marching and, and yelling, man. Uh, and we ended up doing that for seven whole days. Seven whole days. Seven whole days. That's uh, a lot of energy to use um, to voice your opinion. Um. I met an officer named Captain Mike Capania out there who was uh, the exact op opposite of what I expected. What I, and he gave me a completely different energy that I expected. I was full of rage and anger and hatred and discord. And he extended a handshake to me. Um, and I shook his hand. All of that hatred went away and when he extended his hand out for a handshake um, and then challenged me to actually come and talk and find out about police training and learn about the department. And um, a lot of things happened after that. I met our now sheriff of Mecklenburg County, uh, who was a homicide detective, a retired homicide detective at the time of the protest, um, Mr. Gary McFadden, and I uh, met him on the third night of protesting. And um, a lot of things happened on those two days that uh, helped me wake up. But that's how I ended up getting down there and ended up marching and voicing my opinion. So when you say you woke up, what do you mean by that? Um... First getting challenged by Captain Mike Capania, who's now Major Mike Capania, um, really, uh, I just seen an energy shift. Uh, and he introduced me to that energy shift of extending a handshake and what that can do. Um, the video went viral. Uh, we were on World Star, Fox, uh, other news uh, sectors, social media. And to see the power of that handshake um, really just resonated with me. It just helped me wake up. And the night where I met Mr. McFadden, it really all came together for me that night. Um, I seen him come out the department, and I was upset, man. Uh, he was a person that looked like me, the African-American man. Um, could be easily my uncle, my dad, but he wasn't upset. Excuse me, he wasn't voicing his opinion. He walked out of the police department as someone who was contracted with the, the police department to serve. And I didn't understand what privilege he thought he had to be able to just walk out and voice his opinion like that and just kind of tell me what he was doing there. So I ran up to him and I said, hey, man, who do you think you are? You know, it wasn't just who you think you are, but it's a lot of curse words involved in that. And he asked me three questions that literally changed my life, man. He said, you want justice, right? And I was like, yeah. He said, well, do you know what justice is? Have you ever seen justice? 
And do you know what justice looks like if you've seen it? And I, a- I answered no to every question. I was out there screaming for something I've never had, I've never seen, and I didn't know what it looked like if I did see it. And he said, from there he had me. Um, our crowd dwindled down from about 30 people talking to him to five, where I met the co-founder of Heal Charlotte, one of my partners, Antoine Smith. And it was me, Antoine, Jeff Preptee, and Mo Crane out there. And we listened because we didn't know what we were talking about. We didn't know what we were asking for. We just know, we knew that was the mantra. We knew that was the thing to say. And one thing happened out there while we were talking, and I think we all woke up, including Mr. McFadden. Sheriff McFadden at this time and there was a gunshot that went off and we hear it on his walkie talkie it says protester shot protester shot protester shot and he looks at us and he says don't you go nowhere you stay right here let me find out what that is he runs inside he comes back out he says yeah a protester has shot a protester it was an accident shooting and uh, we all looked at each other, and we said, this ain't why we out here. This is, um, this is not why we came out here. We didn't come out here for another person to lose their lives, just for voicing their opinion. Um, and his name is Justin Carr. He's one of the forgotten, forgotten beautiful spirits of this story that people don't talk about enough. He's a young man, somebody's grand grandson, somebody's child, who was out there voicing his opinion and got gunned down in the middle of the street. So from there, man, we decided to first get educated about what we wanted to impact and what we wanted to change and how we wanted to be an influence in, in our community and how to mobilize. Because honestly, David, none of the work, none of the stuff that we've done previously, we didn't, we didn't deserve to be out there protesting. Our previous resume did not warrant for us to be out there voicing our opinion. We have not sowed a seed in our community at all. Me personally, I did not sow a seed where I was living at at all for me to be so upset at people who were living and doing public service every day. People did not deserve to be called out for their jobs, especially if you weren't out there working. And I realized that I wasn't doing half of the work that I thought I was. And I, 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 vowed, I vowed to do that and to start sowing seeds where I lived at. Um, and from there, man, we started Hill Charlotte. Uh, organization that was just dedicated to being part of the community and bridge building and uh, bringing people from different silos together that would never be at the table and giving our community a voice. So what are some of the things that Hill Charlotte's done over the last few years? Man, well, we started off doing a... uh, a benefit concert um, to stop violence. That's how we started with a partnership with a press box, which is a venue out here in Charlotte. And um, from there, we went through a transparency workshop, which is a cadet academy training from CMPD, uh, which is in nine hours. So we went to that training. We were part of the first actual training of the transparency workshop. It is something that CMPD created from the protests and the riots. And we went through that and we learned so much about Obama's 21st century guidelines to community safety. And we read on the 1967 Kerner report and we read about um, the attack force continuum, went through a shooting simulation so we can help change our uh, our perspective a little bit and just be able to empathize. The same thing we were asking for, empathy, sympathy, humanizing yourselves. We had to do that ourselves. 
we had to be the change first. And then from there, with a partnership with CMPD and Major Mike Capania and Chief Putney, thank God for Chief Putney, man. Um, I'm from New York where the blue wall is so tall. And um, it's so hard to get to a chief or a major or a lieutenant. And um, my chief of police, man, just gave us a lot of access. And we were able to create a training called the Constructive Con the constructive conversational training where officers were trained on how to humanize and empathize and sympathize themselves beyond the badge um, and be conversationalists. And with help from our mentors and with help from CMPD superiors, we were able to put a uh, system together where these officers would be graded um, and analyzed. So uh, there were results of the training. 75 officers went through it. 25 officers were put on a conversational team. It's called a CCT, CCT team, Constructive Conversational Team, 25 officers that are specialized in having productive conversation with disgruntled neighbors um, that want to voice their opinion about their community. Um, and because there's more Greg Jacksons out there. Those people that come outside that are upset about what's going on, they have a lot of passion, and that passion needs to be utilized and it needs to be turned into leadership. And uh, these officers were able to go out. We had an officer-involved shooting um, in 2016 in November or December, in December, I believe, and these officers were able to go out and uh, talk to this officer involved shooting the gentleman, the Latino gentleman had a gun on him and, you know, they were, you know, justified in their actions, but there were still disgruntled neighbors out there and they were able to conversate with these, these neighbors, these residents of the community. And I got phone calls talking about, Hey man, this worked, you know, I'm having a, a coffee uh, with, someone next week uh, gave them my business card. Uh, they stopped looking to run warrants and give tickets, but started looking at these people as advocates for the community. And then from there, we, uh, we did a Thanksgiving event where, you know, we fed 400 um, people of the Salvation Army's women and kids shelter. Um, so we've been doing that every year since. Uh, we had a winter wonderland where we provided over 200 toys for kids of the community and um, started an after school program literally in the neighborhood that I live in, uh, seeing kids run around with nothing to do and no respect for the community that they live in. I watched my property manager chase these children around and I asked her, I said, if you open up your doors, would you allow me to do a three hour after school program? I'm not a, I'm not a counselor by no means. I'm not a teacher by no means, but I feel like I can pull my friends in that do have those talents. And, uh, I feel like I can mobilize and, uh, she allowed me to do that, which is unheard of for a property manager, um, to be able to open up your doors without charging for the benefit of the community. When I tell you everything is divinely placed, there are heavenly creatures in my neighborhood. There are heavenly creatures in this city which have been connected to the vine of God, man. And uh, it, it has been amazing to watch, to watch God work in my neighborhood. So a lot of stuff that has happened there, um, it's hard to duplicate because you need some foreigners of this world, man, to really, really, really make that thing work. And uh, we've been fortunate enough to have some heavenly, heavenly creatures just walking around and wanting to pour into my neighborhood. Um, and we've been doing events through the grace of God, man. Uh, we've had a 17% crime decrease in my neighborhood kids um we have a cmpd tuesday day where the cops come every tuesday and they talk to the kids and get to know them on a new level and humanize themselves beyond the badge and my community feels safe you know they don't feel policed but they feel like they're there to be served and um it has really 
had an impact. Our emergency calls have went from 77 to 7 a week. Uh, and that's all first responding calls. Um, and uh, from there, we changed our mission. We're now a, we're a place-based. Place based as in we are located where the disparity is at. We are located in our neighborhood. We're a place based organization that focuses on neighborhood revitalization with a holistic approach. Because soon as we found out, oh man, it's not just social injustice. Oh man, it's not just youth development. There's so much more going on that we need to help with. Um, and God keeps putting us in positions to be able to help with that. So last year we were able to do a rental assistance program where we stopped six padlocks in my neighborhood, uh, excuse me, six evictions, and we stopped two padlocks in my neighborhood to keep the families of our youth development program around their place-based organization, their support system. Uh, and through the grace of God, we've been able to get funding to just continuously help inside of the home. And uh, we have just launched our new Heal a Home project. And we're able to help families, man, that are hurting. You give kids three hours of encouragement and hope, and then they go back into 21 hours of disparity and poverty and hurt and pain. And we wanted to be able to, ex to just impact more of the day. We didn't feel like three hours was enough. And it's just been amazing to watch, man. Uh, we are continuously growing and continuously influencing and motivating this city just to be servants, not dictators, um, but allies and friends and mentors and servants of the kingdom and really show what that actually looks like. And through the grace of God, man, we've been blessed to make an impact. What do you think that, what, how is the church doing in your, in your communities to be a force for bringing people together? Um, well, I go to Grace Church Charlotte. It's ran by the Honorable Pastor Theo Schaefer and my First Lady Patrice Schaefer, who is, they're both from down south, uh, my pastor moved to uh to charlotte during the protests and the riots i always tell him god sent him here and we're a church plant so we're not actually a official church but we are all servants we were literally having church inside of the leasing office where we were running the youth development program um 66 percent of kids miss out on a lot of stuff because of transportation and program costs, especially with after schooling. And we just assumed that might be the same thing with church. People are missing out on church because of transportation sometimes. And we were able to have church there and uh, it changed a lot of the culture. Unfortunately in Charlotte, we're the Bible belt. We're part of the Bible belt. And uh, there's a church on every corner. And we are of the saying that Charlotte doesn't need any more buildings. We don't need any more churches, but we need more servants of the Lord. And the, I wish I can say the faith-based community is a spearhead in a lot of the revitalization that is happening, but if that isn't so. Yeah, well, the reason I ask is, I mean, I realize it's a co complicated subject, and I give you all the credit, so much credit for being a positive force in dealing with what happened in Charlotte. Um, Thank you. It just, it, yeah, it seems like that um, the church should be leading the way, and that that there are other forces in our culture that that um, tend to divide us. As well as, mm -hmm. I mean, we all have individual responsibilities for this, but I also think that that they, there are there are forces in the in the media and politics that are just seems like they're just always trying to divide us. And it seems to me like the church is is has the best opportunity to, I mean, they have the best message, first of all, <laughs> and yes. the best oppor opportunity to bring people together. And so, 
Uh, yeah, I was just, I guess I was just curious. What, yeah, no, that was a great mean, question, man. Yeah. It's a great question. And the church is, to me as a man of God, the church is responsible um, and has a duty. Um, it is our God-given duty to disciple, to feed his lamb, to feed his sheep, um, to help the impoverished, to hurt the pain, you know, and to walk with the imperfect. You know, we're all imperfect, but to walk with those, even if we feel we're saved, we're we're still flawed in some way, being in this flesh, and we should all be serving. Um, and that's what Jesus would do. And uh, the the denominations is is hurting us. The uh, separation of what type of Christian you are. Is, is hurting the Christian community. It's hurting all faith-based communities. It's just we shouldn't be separated through race and denominations. Um, for Jesus walked with us all, you know. His disciples were, you know, spread it out. They were from different places. And before we were Christians in the Bible, we were just people of God. Um, before Peter denied Jesus three times, they didn't say, oh, you're that Christian. They said, hey, you sound like Jesus. You're, you're one of his guys. You're one of his people. And we need to get back to being people of God and people of the kingdom and not, I'm a Baptist. I'm a Presbyterian. It, we're all children of God. And we should all be serving in that matter. That's why I love cross worship. I love cross worship, David. It gives the opportunity for us to say we all praise and worship the same God and we're different from each other, but we're the same um, because of our level of faith. The blessing that Abraham is upon us because of our level of faith. It says it in the Bible, due to the measure of your faith. Not the color of your skin, not the height of your body, not the weight, not anything else, not your job description, but due to the level of your faith, not your age. And we need to really, really get back to the word. If we can apply the word, the Bible, the, the Old Testament, the New Testament, the, the word of God, if we can apply that and stick to that, we'll be a much better religion. In a much stronger religion, and Jesus will be smiling every day, man. How do we identify with ourselves as Christians instead of all the ways that we all identify ourselves by our color of our skin or our, our job or our denomination? How do you how do you how do you think? What advice can you give all of us listening to this to identify our set with ourselves as Christ Jesus? Yes. Please identify yourself by your impact. Please identify yourself by the impact you make in the world. I am a servant of the Lord. Some people are preachers. Some people are disciples. Some people are evangelists. But we all need to identify ourselves by our impact and what we do for the Lord. And that's how I, I tell everybody, before I tell you I'm a founder and executive director of Hill Charlotte, I am a servant of the Lord first, before anything. And that is a common ground that me and anyone that is a child of God can work with. We can always start there. All right. I I don't know how, quite how to ask this, but... Speak if you could before we wrap up, because I'll, yeah. I'll be honest with you. I, we all kind of get in our own bubbles, and I'm in my own bubble when it comes to a lot of issues. Talk to African Americans who are listening to this who feel angry about racial differences, and then at the same, and then separately talk to those who can't relate to African Americans because they're not. African Americans, and maybe they have trouble seeing the viewpoint of someone who grew up differently than they did and looks differently than they did. Yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know if that's the right way to ask that question, but I mean, I guess, I guess I'm asking you to kind of talk to both people who might yeah. be listening. Man, and, and with family, man, it was thought, a great question. Give them some thoughts on how to how to approach this 
this whole issue of racism in our country? I love the question, man. Um, we just had a meeting last week, and my friend Sean Corbett, who is uh, the founder of Cops and Barber, Barbers out here, he's a barber, um, and he said he was talking about the wall, the blue wall, the CMPD wall, um, and we're from New York where that wall is so big. And as he was talking about that wall, man, I started thinking about the African-American community and the wall that we have up against everybody because of what our history tells us and the type of things that our ancestors had to go through so we can have the freedoms that we have today. We are securing our culture and securing our families, but it's also a wall that doesn't allow people to get over. People that don't look like us, uh, talk like us, from, from the backgrounds that we're from, from the struggles that we're from. Our wall is so big, man, sometimes a cop can't climb the wall. Sometimes that middle-aged white man that is in corporate America can't climb that wall, and it's intimidating. And I want to urge everybody, man, to put your wall down. There needs to be a level of trust and legitimate bond that has to happen so people can work with each other. And when I was able to lower my wall brick by brick, I'm not saying you're going to demolish your wall in one day, but brick by brick. Take your wall down. And this is for both sides. This is for everybody. We all have a wall up that we are trying to, like, save ourselves from something when we all need each other. And that, that wall that gets teared down, when you can tear it down and start building it back up together, it is an amazing, amazing, amazing transformation that happens for everybody involved, man. I have people from south side of Charlotte, uh, the Myers Park area, which is the rich area of Charlotte, which, of course, are more so my um, Caucasian brothers and sisters. But they reach out to me. They come to my neighborhood. They pour into it. They help pay people's rent. That's because I had to tear my perception of what I thought they were up to. You have a hidden agenda. You're going to hurt me. And I had to trust in the Lord first that he would not lead me astray. And that helped me trust a lot of people, man, that I never thought I would, but my wall had to come down. And speaking to... <laughs> Our, our brothers and sisters of the corporate America world, man, the empathy that needs to happen to build a real infrastructure from top to bottom, it has to be built from bottom to top. We can no longer plan to help somebody from a bird's eye view. We have to be on the ground. We have to build a foundation or else the building will crumble and it will fall apart. And that's the, the bird eye view is, is what I tell everyone. And I help them understand that's how you're planning to help. And to my corporate family, my, my white constituents, my, my, my family, my brothers and sisters that don't look like me, man, it is not going to be one thing that you do that is just going to make an impact. It's going to take some time and you need to be patient and be consistent and be intentional. And that's, that's really, David, that's for everybody because nobody is different, man. Everybody is impatient. Everybody is inconsistent from the black side to the white side. And that's the, there's no separation of information or advice. Everybody needs the same advice. Tear your wall down. Stop planning from a bird's eye view. Be empathetic. Be consistent. And build some trust. 
All right, that is good advice, and I think that's a good way to wrap things up. Um, do you have any quick final thoughts before we finish this? Yes, um, please visit uh, healcharlotte.org. That's heal, H-E-A-L, charlotte.org. Um, that is our website where you can get a bunch of information about what we're doing. Uh, volunteer your time, volunteer your information. Always be willing to serve your time, your talent, and your treasure. If you can't do your time, you have a talent. If you don't have a talent, you have a treasure. But you can serve all three, or you can pick which one you can do. But there's always something you can do. We have a saying at Hill Charlotte, if everybody does a little bit, nobody would have to do a lot embody that and go and salt the earth people god bless you and thank you dave for giving me this nice opportunity man i really really appreciate you man well, i appreciate you coming on i appreciate you get, uh, rolling your sleeves up and trying to make a difference in a dealing with a difficult situation and issue in our culture so i appreciate it yes god bless you brother thank right. you so much all right got all right, got all right. bye Men at Work, I hope you've enjoyed this interview as much as I have. We just heard about Greg Jackson's journey, being spirit-led and living out his Christian faith through his work. Each of our journeys are unique, but hopefully you've heard something in this episode to inspire you and give direction for your own personal daily work life. You can find links and other information from this show at DaveHilgendorf.com. Until next time, have a great day and God bless.